Hey guys. So I'm back for chapter 10 of Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban. Like I said yesterday, this is one of my favorite chapters. Uh, yesterday we got to read about Sirius Black um, and what happened after he attacked the fat lady. So um, then Harry played in his, in his Quidditch game and Dementors came onto the field and Harry got knocked out and he fell down. Um, so let's read chapter 10, Murderer's Map. Let's find out what happens next. Madam Pomfrey insisted on keeping Harry in the hospital wing for the rest of the weekend. He didn't argue or complain, but he wouldn't let her throw away the shattered remains of his Nimbus 2000. He knew he was being stupid, knew that the Nimbus was beyond repair, but Harry couldn't help it. He felt as though he'd lost one of his best friends. He had a stream of visitors, all intent on cheering him up. Hagrid sent him a bunch of earwiggy flowers that looked like yellow cabbages. And Jenny Weasley, blushing furiously, turned up with a get-well card she had made herself, which sang shrilly, shrilly, unless Harry kept it shut under his fruit bowl of fruit. The Gryffindor routine visited again on Sunday morning, this time accompanied by Wood, who told Harry, in a hollow, dead sort of voice, that he didn't blame him in the slightest. Ron and Hermione left Harry's bedside only at night, but nothing anyone said or did could make Harry feel any better because they knew only half of what was troubling him. He hadn't told anyone about the Grimm, not even Ron and Hermione, because he knew Ron would panic and Hermione would scoff. The fact remained, however, that it had now appeared twice and both appearances had been followed by near fatal accidents. The first time, he had nearly been run over by the night bus. The second, fallen 50 feet from his broomstick. Was the Grimm going to haunt him until he actually died? Was he going to spend the rest of his life looking over his shoulder for the beast? And then there were the Dementors. Harry felt sick and humiliated every time he thought of them. Everyone said the Dementors were horrible, but no one else collapsed every time they were near one. No one else heard echoes in their head of their dying parents. Because Harry knew that screaming voice belonged, knew who that screaming voice belonged to now. He had heard her words, heard them over and over again during the night hours in the hospital wing while he lay awake, staring at the stripes of moonlight on the ceiling. When the Dementors approached him, he heard the last moments of his mother's life, her attempts to protect him, Harry, from Lord Voldemort and Voldemort's laughter before he murdered her. Harry dozed fitfully, sinking into dreams full of clammy, rotted hands and petrified pleading, jerking awake to dwell again on his mother's voice. It was a relief to return to the noise and bustle of the main school on Monday, where he was forced to think about other things, even if he had to endure Draco Malfoy's taunting. Malfoy was almost beside himself with the glee at Gryffindor's defeat, he had finally taken off his bandages and celebrated having the full use of both arms again by doing spirited imitations of Harry falling off of his broom. Malfoy spent much, much of their next potions class doing Dementor impersonations across the dungeon. Ron finally cracked and flung a large slippery crocodile heart at Malfoy, which hit him in the face and caused Snape to take 50 points from Gryffindor. If Snape's teaching defense against the dark arts again, I'm skipping off, said Ron as they headed toward Lupin's classroom after lunch. Check who's in there, Hermione. Hermione peered around the classroom door. It's okay. Professor Lupin was back at work. It certainly looked as though he had been ill. His robes were hanging near loosely on him, and there were dark shadows beneath his eyelids. Nevertheless, he smiled at the class as they took their sleep seats, and they burst at once into an explosion of complaints about Snape's behavior while Lupin had been ill. It's not fair. He was only filling in. Why should he give us homework? We don't know anything about werewolves. Two rolls of parchment! Did you tell Professor Snape we hadn't covered them yet? Did you tell Professor Snape they haven't covered them yet? Lupin asked them, frowning slightly. The babble broke out again. Yes, but he said we were really behind. 
He wouldn't listen to rolls of parchment. Professor Lupin smiled at the look of indignation on every face. Don't worry. I'll speak to Professor Snape. You don't have to do the essay. Oh, no, said Hermione, looking very disappointed. I've already finished it. They had a very enjoyable lesson. Professor Lupin had brought along a glass box containing a hanky punk, a little one-legged creature who looked as though he were made of wisp of smoke, rather frail and harmless looking. Lures travelers into bogs, said Professor Lupin as they took notes. Did you notice the lantern dangling from his hand? Hops ahead. People follow the light. Then the hanky punk made a horrible squelching noise against the glass. When the bell rang, everyone gathered up their things and headed for the door. Harry among them, but wait a moment, Harry, called Lupin. I'd like a word. Harry doubled back. He watched Professor Lupin covering the hanky punk's box with a cloth. I heard about the match, said Lupin, turning back to his desk and staring to a pile of books from his briefcase. Sorry about your broomstick, Harry. Is there any chance of fixing it? No, said Harry. The tree smashed it to bits. Lupin sighed. They planted the Whomping Willow the same year I arrived at Hogwarts. People used to play a game. Trying to get near enough to touch the trunk. In the end, a boy called Davy Gungeon nearly lost his eye, and we for were forbidden to go near it. No broomstick would have a chance. Did you hear about the Dementors, too? Said Harry, with difficulty. Lubin looked at him quickly. Yes, I did. I don't think any of us have seen Professor Dumbledore that angry. They have been growing restless for some time. Furious at his refusal to let them inside the grounds. I suppose they were the reason you fell. Yes, said Harry. He hesitated, and then the question he had to ask burst from before him, and he couldn't stop. Why? Why do they affect me like that? Am I just... It has nothing to do with weakness, said Professor Lupin, sharply as though Harry, he had read Harry's mind. The Dementors affect you worse than the others because there are horrors in your past that the others do not have. A ray of wintry sunlight fell across the classroom, illuminating Lupin's gray hairs and the lines on his own face. Dementors are some of the worst creatures to walk this earth. They infest the darkest, filthiest place. They glory in decay, despair. They drain peace, hope, happiness. They drain it right out of there around them. Even muggles feel their presence, Harry. Though they can't see them. Get too near a Dementor, and every good feeling, every happy memory, will be sucked right out of you. If it can, the Dementor will feed on you long enough to reduce you to something like itself, soulless and evil. You'll be left with nothing but the worst experiences in your life. And the worst that happened to you, Harry, is, is enough to make anyone fall off their broom. You have nothing to feel ashamed of. When they get near me, Harry stared at Lupin's desk, his throat tight. I, I can hear Voldemort murdering my mom. Lupin made a sudden motion with his arms as though to grip Harry's shoulder, but thought better of it. There was a moment's silence then why did they come to the match? Said Harry bitterly. They're getting hungry, said Lupin coolly, shutting his briefcase with a snap. Dumbledore won't let them into the school, so their supply of human prey has dried up. I don't think they could resist the large crowd at the Quidditch field. All that excitement, emotions running high, it was their idea of a feast. Ask him, must be terrible, Harry muttered. Lupin nodded grimly. The fortress is set on a tiny island way out to sea, but they don't need walls and water to keep the prisoners in. Not when they're all trapped inside their own heads, 
incapable of a single cheerful thought, most of them go mad within weeks. But Sirius Black escaped from them, said Harry slowly. He got away. Lupin's briefcase slipped from the desk. He had to stoop quickly to catch it. Yes, he said, straightening up. Black must have found a way to fight them. I wouldn't have believed it possible. Dementors are supposed to drain a wizard of his powers if he is left with them for too long. You made the Dementor on the train back off, said Harry suddenly. There are certain defenses one can use, said Lupin. But there was only one Dementor on the train. The more there are, the more difficult it comes to resist. What defenses? Harry said at once. Can you teach me? I don't pretend to be an expert at fighting Dementors, Harry. Quite the contrary. But if the Dementors come to another Quidditch match, I need to be able to fight them. Lupin looked into, into Harry's determined face, hesitated, then said, Well, all right. I'll try and help. But you'll have to wait until next term, I'm afraid. I have a lot to do for the holidays. She has a very inconvenient time to fall ill. What with the promise of anti-dementor lessons from Lupin, the thought that he might never have to hear his mother's death again, and the fact that Ravenclaw, Flat, and Hufflepuff and their Quidditch matched at the end of November, Harry's mood took quite a different upturn. Gryffindor were not out of the running after all, although they could not afford to lose another match. Wood became repossessed of his manic energy, and worked his team as hard as ever in the chilly haze of the rain that persisted into December. Harry saw no hint of a Dementor within the grounds. Dumbledore's anger seemed to be keeping them at their stations at the entrance. Two weeks before the end of the term, the sky lightened suddenly to a dazzling opaline white, and the muddy grounds were revealed one morning covered in glittering frost. Inside the castle, there was a buzz of Christmas in the air. Professor Flitwick, the charge teacher, had already decorated his classroom with shimmering lights that turned out to be real fluttering fairies. The students were all happily discussing their plans for the holiday. Both Ron and Hermione had decided to remain at Hogwarts. <coughs> and though Ron said it was because he couldn't stand two weeks with Percy, and Hermione insisted she needed to use the library, Harry wasn't fooled. They were doing it to keep him company, and he was very grateful. To everyone's delight, except Harry's, there was to be another Hogsmeade trip on the very last weekend of term. We can do all of our Christmas shopping there, said Hermione. Mom and Dad would really love those tooth-flossing streamers from Honeydukes. Resigned to the fact that he would be only 30, the only third year staying behind again, Harry borrowed a copy of Witch Broomstick from Wood and decided to spend the rest of the day reading up on different makes. He had been riding one of the school brooms at team practice, an ancient shooting star, which was very slow and jerky. He definitely needed a new broom of his own. On the Saturday morning of the Hogsmeade trip, Harry bid goodbye to Ron and Hermione, who were wrapped in cloaks and scarves, then turned up the rep marble staircase alone and headed back towards Gryffindor Tower. Snow had started to fall outside the windows, and the castle was st still and quiet. Harry. He turned. Halfway along the third corridor, and he saw Fred and George peering out at him from behind a statue of humpback, the one-eyed witch. What are you doing? said Harry curiously. How come you're not going to Hogsmeade? We've come to give you a bit of festive cheer before we go, said Fred with a mysterious wink. Come in here. He nodded toward an empty classroom to the left of the one-eyed statue. Harry followed Fred and George inside. George closed the door quietly and then turned, beaming, to look at Harry. Early Christmas present for you, Harry, he said. Fred pulled something from inside his cloak with a flourish and laid it on one of the desks. It was a large, square, very worn piece of parchment with nothing written on it. Harry, suspecting one of Fred and George's jokes, stared at it. What's that supposed to be? This, Harry, is a secret of our successes, said George, patting this parchment fondly. It's a wrench giving it to you, said Fred. But we decided last night your names are better than ours. 
Anyway, we know by heart, said George. We bequeath it to you. We don't need it anymore. And what do I need with a bit of old parchment? Said Harry. A bit of old parchment, said Fred, closing his eyes with a grimace as though Harry had mortally offended him. Explain, George. Well, when we were in our first year, Harry, young, carefree, and innocent, Harry snorted. He doubted whether Fred and George had ever been innocent. Well, more innocent than we are now. We got into a spot of bother with Filch. We let off a dung bomb in the corridor, and it upset him for some reason. So he called us off to his office and started threatening us with the usual. Detention, disembowelment, ugh. And we couldn't help noticing a drawer in one of his filing cabinets mark confiscated and highly dangerous. Don't tell me. Harry started to grin. Well, what have you done? Said Fred. George caught the diversion by dropping another dung bomb and I whipped the drawer open and grabbed this. Not as bad as it sounds, you know, said George. I don't reckon Phyllis ever found out how it worked. He probably suspected what it was, though, or he wouldn't have confiscated it. And you know how to work it? Oh, yes, said Fred, smirking. This little beauty's taught us more than all the teachers in this school. You're winding me up, said Harry, looking at the ragged old bit of parchment. Oh, are we? Said George. He took out his wand, touched the parchment lightly, and said, I solemnly swear that I'm up to no good. And at once, ink lines began to spread like a spider's web from the point that George's wand had touched. They joined each other. They crisscrossed. They fanned into every corner of the parchment. Then words began to blossom across the top. Great curly green words that proclaimed. Messrs. Mooney, Wormtail, Padfoot, and Prong. Persuaders of aid to magical mischief makers are proud to present the murderer's map. It was a map showing every detail of the Hogwarts castle and grounds. But the truly remarkable thing were the tiny ink dots moving around it, each labeled with a name in minuscule writing. Astounded, Harry bent over. A labeled dot in the top left corner showed that Professor Dumbledore was pacing his study. The caretaker's cat, Mrs. Norris, was prowling the second floor, and Peeves the poltergeist was currently bouncing around the trophy room. And as Harry's eyes traveled up and down the familiar corridors, he noticed something else. This map showed a set of passages he had never entered, and many of them led right to Hogsmeade, said Fred, tracing one of them with his finger. There are seven in all. Now, Filch knows about these four, and he pointed them out, but we're sure we're the only ones who know about these. Don't bother with the one behind the mirror on the fourth floor. We used it last winter, but it's caved in, completely blocked. And we don't reckon anyone's ever used this one because the Whomping Will is planted right over the entrance. But this one here, this one leads right into the cellar of Honeydukes. We've used it loads of times. And you might have noticed the entrance is right outside this room, through that one-eyed old crone's hump. Oh, Mooney, Wormtail, Padfoot, and Prongs. Sighed George, patting the head of the map. We owe them so much. Noble men working tirelessly to help a new generation of lawbreakers, said Fred solemnly. Right, said George briskly. Don't forget to wipe it after you use it. Or anyone can use it, said Fred warningly. Just tap it again and say, mischief managed, and it'll go blank. So, young Harry, said Fred in an uncanny impersonation of Percy, mind you behave yourself. See you in Honeydukes, said George, winking. They left the room, both smirking in a satisfied sort of way. Harry stood there gazing at the miraculous map. He watched the tiny ink Mrs. Norris turn left and pause to sniff at something on the floor. If Filch really didn't know, he wouldn't have to pass the Dementors at all. 
But even as he stood there, flooded with excitement, something Harry had once heard Mr. Weasley say came floating out of his memory. Never trust anything that can think for itself if you can't see where it keeps its brain. The map was one of those dangerous magical objects Mr. Weasley had been warning him against. Aids for magical mischief makers. But then, Harry reasoned, he only wanted to use it to go into Hogsmeade. It wasn't as though he wanted to steal anything or attack anyone. Fred and George had been using it for years without anything happening. Harry traced the secret passage to Honeydukes with his finger. Then, quite suddenly, as though following orders, he rolled the map, stuffed it inside of his robes, and hurried to the door of the classroom. He opened it a couple inches. There was no one outside. Very carefully, he edged out of the room and behind the statue of the one-eyed witch. What did he have to do? He pulled out the map again and saw to his astonishment that a new ink figure had appeared upon it, labeled Harry Potter. This figure was standing exactly where the real Harry Potter was standing, about halfway down the third corridor. Harry watched carefully. His little ink self appeared to be tapping the witch with his minute wand. Harry quickly took out his real wand and tapped the statue. Nothing happened. He looked back at the back of the map. The tiniest speech bubble had appeared next to his figure. The word inside said, Disascendium. Disascendium. Harry whispered, tapping the stone witch again. At once, the statue's hump opened wide enough to admit a fairly thin person. Harry glanced quickly up and down the corridor, then tucked the map away, hoisted himself into the hole head first, and pushed forward. He slid a considerable way down what felt like a stone slide. Then landed on cold damp earth. He stood up looking around. It was pitch dark. He held under Lumos and saw that he was in a very narrow, low, earthy passageway. He raised the map, tapped it with the tip of his wand and muttered, mischief managed. The map went blank at once. He folded it carefully, tucked it inside of his robes. Then his heart beating fast, both excited and apprehensive, he set off. The passage twisted and turned, more like the burrow of a giant rabbit than anything else. Harry hurried along it, stumbling now and then on the uneven floor, holding out his wand in front of him. It took ages, but Harry had the thought of Honeydukes to sustain him. After what felt like an hour, the passage began to rise. Panting, Harry sped up, his face hot, his feet very cold. Ten minutes later, he came to the foot of some worn steps, to which rose out of sight above him. Careful not to make any noise, Harry began to climb. A hundred steps, two hundred steps. He lost count as he climbed, watching his feet. Then, without warning, his head hit something hard. It seemed to be a trap door. Harry stood there, massaging the top of his head, listening. He couldn't hear any sounds above him. Very slowly, he pushed the trap door open and peered over the edge. He was in a cellar, which was full of wooden crates and boxes. Harry climbed out of the trap door and then replaced the top. It blended so perfectly with the dusty floor that it was impossible to tell it was there. Harry crept slowly toward the wooden staircase that led upstairs. Now he could definitely hear voices, not to mention the tinkle of a bell and the opening and shutting of a door. Wondering what he ought to do, he suddenly heard a door open much closer at hand. Somebody was about to come downstairs. And get another box of jelly slugs, dear. They've nearly cleaned us out, said a woman's voice. A pair of feet was coming down the staircase. Here he leapt behind an enormous crate and waited for the footsteps to pass. He heard a man shifting boxes against the opposite wall. He might not get another chance. Quietly and silently, Harry sideways and then straightened up. Honeydews was so crowded with Hogwarts students that no one looked twice at Harry. He edged among them looking around and suppressed a laugh as he imagined the look that would spread over Dudley's piggy face if he could see where Harry was now. There were shelves upon shelves of the most succulent looking sweets imaginable, creamy chunks of nougat, shimmering pink squares of coconut ice, fat honey colored toffees, hundreds of different kinds of chocolates in neat rows. There was a large barrel of every flavor beans and another of fizzing whispies and levitating sherbet balls that Ron had mentioned. Along yet another wall were special effects suites. 
Struble's Best Blowing Gum, which filled a room with bluebell colored bubbles that refused to pop for days, the strange splintery tooth flossing sermons, tiny black pepper imps, breathe fire for your friends, ice mint, mints, hear your teeth chatter and squeak, peppermint cream shaped like toads, hop realistically in the stomach, fragile sugar spun quills, and exploding bonbons. Harry squeezed himself through a crowd of sick fears and saw a sign hanging in the farthest shop corner of the shop. Unusual taste. Ron and Hermione were standing underneath it, examining a tray of blood-flavored lollipops. Harry sneaked up behind them. Ah, uh, no. Harry won't want any of those. They're for vampires, I expect, Hermione was saying. How about bees? said Ron, shoving a jar of cockroach clusters under Hermione's nose. Definitely not, said Harry. Ron nearly dropped the, dropped the jar. Harry, squeaked Hermione. What are you doing here? How, how did you? Wow, said Ron, looking very impressed. You've learned to apparate. Of course I haven't, said Harry. His voice so that none of the six years could hear him and told them all about the martyr's mouth. How come Fred and George never gave it to me? said Ron, outraged. I'm their brother! But Harry isn't going to keep it, said Hermione, as though the idea were ludicrous. He's going to hand it into Professor McGonagall, aren't you, Harry? No, I'm not, said Harry. Are you mad? said Ron, goggling at Hermione. Hand in something that good? If I hand it in, I'll have to say where I got it. Filch would know Fred and George had nicked it. But what about Sirius Black? Said Hermione. He could be using one of the passages on the map to get into the castle. The teachers have got to know. She hissed. He can't be getting in through the ca a passage, said Harry quickly. There are seven secret tunnels on the map, right? Fred and George reckon Phil Journey knows about four of them. And of the other three, one of them's caved in so that no one can get through. One of them's got the Whomping Willow planted over the entrance so you can't get out of it. And the one I just came through, well, it's really hard to see the entrance down in the cellar. So unless he knew it was there, Harry hesitated. What if Black did know the passage was there? Ron, however, cleared his throat significantly and pointed to a notice pasted on the inside of the sweet shop by order of the Ministry of Magic. Customers are reminded that until further notice, Dementors will be patrolling the streets of Hogsmeade every night after sundown. This measure has been put into place for the safety of Hogsmeade residents and will be lifted upon the recapture of Sirius Black. It is therefore advisable that you complete your shopping well before nightfall. Merry Christmas. See? said Ron quietly. I'd like to see Black try and break into Honeydukes with Dementors swarming all over the village. Anyway, Hermione, the Honeydukes owners would hear a break-in, wouldn't they? They'd live over the shop. Yes, but, but, Hermione seemed to be struggling to find another problem. Look, Harry still shouldn't be coming into Hogsmeade. He hasn't got a signed form. If anyone finds out, he'll be in so much trouble. And it's not nightfall yet. What if Sirius Black turns up today? Now, He'd have a job spotting Harry in this, said Ron, nodding through the mully windows at the thick, swirling snow. Come on, Hermione, it's Christmas. Harry deserves a break. Hermione bit her lip, looking extremely worried. Are you going to report me? Harry asked her, grinning. Oh, of course not. But honestly, Harry. Seen the fizzing Wisbys, Harry? said Ron, grabbing him and leading him over to the barrel. And the jelly slugs and the acid pops? Fred gave me one of those when I was seven. It burned a hole right through my tongue. Oof, I remember Mom walloping him with, his bro with her broomstick, said Ron, brooding into the acid pops box. Reckon Fred would take a bit of cockroach cluster if I told him they were peanuts? What do you think? When Ron and Hermione had paid for all their sweets outside, Hogsmeade looked like a Christmas card. A little thatched cottages and shops were all covered in a layer of crisp snow. They were headed up the street, heads bowed against the wind, Ron and Hermione shouting through their scarves. 
That's the post office. Zocco's is up there. We could go up to the Shrieking Shack. Tell you what, said Ron, his teeth chattering. Shall we go for a butterbeer in the three broomstick? Three broomsticks? Harry was more than willing. The wind was fierce and his hands were freezing, so they crossed the road. And in a minute, they were entering the tiny inn. It was extremely crowded, noisy, warm, and smoky. A curvy sort of woman with, with a pretty face was serving a bunch of rowdy warlocks up, up the bar. That's Rad Madame Rose Murda, said Ron. I'll get the drink, shall I? He added, going slightly red. Harry and her later, carrying three foaming tankards of hot bunny beer. Merry Christmas, he said happily, raising his tankard. Harry drank deeply. It was the most delicious thing he had ever tasted and seemed to heat every bit of him from the inside. A sudden breeze ruffled his hair. The door of the three broomsticks had opened again. Harry looked over the room of his tankard and choked. Professors McGonagall and Flitwick had just entered the pub with a flurry of snowflakes, shortly followed by Hagrid, who was in deep conversation with a portly man in lime green bowler hat and a pinstroke cloak, Cornelius Fudge, Minister of Magic. In an instant, Ron and Hermione had both placed both hands on the top of Harry's head and forced him off of the stool and under the table. Dripping with butterbeer and crouching out of sight, Harry clutched his empty tankard and watched the teachers and Fudge move their feet toward the bar, pause, and then turn and walk right toward him. Somewhere above him, Hermione whispered, the Christmas tree beside their table rose a few inches off the ground, drifted sideways, and landed with a soft bump right in front of their table, hiding them hiding them from view. Staring through the dense lower branches, Harry saw four sets of large legs move back from the table right beside theirs, then heard the grunts and sighs of the teachers and ministers as they sat down. Next, he saw another pair of feet wearing sparkly turquoise high heels and heard a woman's voice. So guys, actually for today, that is where we're going to stop. That meets our 30 minute mark. So we are going to resume the rest of chapter 10, find out who the woman is and if Harry is going to be caught in Hogsmeade. The next time we have a reading session. Okay. Make sure that you comment. Let me know that you're watching so I can find out if we should start doing our science videos on growing a garden and some different stuff on plants. All right, guys, I'll see you soon. Bye.